Hi everyone and welcome to the Photoshop show. Um, I'm really anxious about tonight, well not I'm anxious because I didn't have a start broadcast button, but we got it uh, started okay. Um, I want to welcome you and tonight the topic is creative post-processing and I'd like to walk you through in a few minutes a before and after of an image that was literally ready to be deleted. I, I had pretty much put it on the cutting room floor and uh, that's where it's at for a little while and then I thought oh, let me just see what I can do with it. So I'm really anxious to show you uh, the result of that, what had happened. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to do a couple of introductions. First, Jan is teaching tonight, and she wasn't able to join us. So um, I'm kind of hosting and being the guest at the same time. But I've invited some excellent people along to help, and they'll communicate in the chat room. Um, first, we have, uh, I get it right, Angelica Perry, Angie. <laughs> <'Cause>, Hello. <laughs> I wouldn't want to get that wrong. So, Angie, hi. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm really, really psyched to be here. <laughs> Do you want to want me to say something a little bit? <laughs> well, just a little bit about uh, you know where you're from and what you've been doing lately. And, you know, well, uh, lately, <laughs> I had a very short and very interesting trip to Canada. <laughs> yes, I remember well. <laughs> And uh, I'm looking forward to going to uh, California next, and hopefully I'll be catching up with Dave. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I've just been shooting, trying to um, you know get better at it, trying to be more creative. So I can't re I can't wait to see what you did with this picture. <laughs> I'm really excited about that. <laughs> well, I'm glad this isn't. Um, it's not about compositing or or some uh, fancy Photoshop techniques. In fact, this. Everything I do can be done both 100% in Lightroom or in the Camera Raw module of Photoshop. So if you only have Photoshop, don't worry, you can do this. I just work within Camera Raw, and you can bring it into Photoshop if you want. But I wanted to just do a demonstration that shows everyone you can do really creative work uh, right inside Lightroom without having to export to a plugin or to Photoshop. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with plugins. I love them myself. I think they're a great creative tool. But just to be able to see that before they were created, it, it was done just with inside programs. And for this one, I challenged myself to do it 100% within Lightroom. Wow. So, and yeah, Elizabeth, you know what? I just have to say that all three people in this room met in real life at Photoshop World last September. Yeah. So that's really exciting. Yeah, I just realized that. So Elizabeth, hi, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing good. Um, what have been, actually, yesterday, I, if anybody knows me knows I have a little fascination with cows. And I went on a little spring road trip and got to meet a lovely herd of highland cows. <laughs> and that was, that was actually a lot of fun. Um, the people actually met on Google Plus as well, and they have a um, website called um, Long Dream Farms. So if you look on Google Plus, they're there, and they have Highland cattle, Dexter cattle, goats, chickens, emus, um, all kinds of stuff, and just really nice people and beautiful, beautiful farm too, with a little pond and everything. Uh, wow. And also, I'd like to. Do a shout out to Krista Ray in the scavenger hunt. Oh yeah, let's just do finished up one, and then there's another one. The signups are this Friday at 11 o'clock Pacific time, 11 in the morning Pacific time on Friday. So want to do that? They're always a lot of fun. Yeah, they are. I uh, I haven't successfully participated in one. I did judge the one previous to the last one, and I had just a blast. It was a great time. Yeah. One thing I can say about this. It's right. just nonstop enthusiasm, which is great. Yeah, one thing I can say, if you haven't looked it up, uh, and maybe one of uh, Dave or one of you can type into the yep, page, I can uh, put a link in. Crystal Race Scavenger Hunt. If you haven't participated in one, it, it's done more to improve people's enthusiasm and their level of photography than almost anything else uh, on Google Plus on the internet. I'm I'm just always blown away at the level of growth by the photographers participating in the Crystal Race Scavenger Hunt. And yeah, so, I, I really, I really yeah, think it's a, a really great way to 
for people to stretch their stretch their wings out into areas they hadn't thought about. Because what's what's so neat is this is such a it's a group from people who shoot with their cell phones or just a point and shoot or just you know barely getting started to those that can do you know you know who know Photoshop backwards and forwards and layering compositing. But some of the most amazing photos that come out are are some of the ones that come from you know the simplest you know, shot with, with little manipulation. And it's just neat to see how people interpret the different categories. And for those of you who don't know, you know, there's, know. There, there are 10 different, different topics each time. And, you know, there's, sometimes there's a color. I think one of the ones this time was, was healthy, um, embrace. Um, yeah, usually like an emotion or something. Emotion, like yeah. And just uh, how, how different people interpret that, I think, really helps uh, kickstart your own creativity. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll put a link into the into the chat, but uh, it's Krista Ray. If you just uh, search for her profile also, C-H-R-Y-S-T-A-R-A-E. And yeah, again, signups are um, 11 a.m. Pacific, uh, 2 o'clock Eastern, uh, Friday the 21st. And the 500 slots will fill up within a couple hours. I'm yeah, sure. they fill up pretty fast. I well, remember that. How often does she do that? Is um, it, once a think, quarter. Yeah, I think a cycle takes about three months. Yeah. Okay. There's yeah. two months of the kind of the, the shooting, you know, the, the release of the list and the shooting time, and then by all the collecting and judging and then releasing them, you know, over a period of days, it's, you know, about three months total. Okay. <laughs> okay, now I want to uh, transition. Dave, I didn't really do an introduction. You kind of, you were talking, though, anyway. Is anything... Um, Anything quick that you have coming up, or you're just kind of saying well, what's nothing, up? nothing special coming up. I'm just I I'm thankful to be where it's not cold. We're just enjoying the the mustard is finally peaking here in in Napa Valley. And if you haven't seen the the yellow wild mustard fields in Napa Valley, uh, along with the California poppies along the road, it's 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 quite a sight, and just really enjoying driving through the valley. Okay. I've seen your pictures. I had no idea that mustard grows like that. <laughs> that it's so pretty, really. Yeah, it is. It is beautiful. How long does it stay that way? Uh, about a month or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll be missing it. <laughs> yeah, you'll be on the tail end. Uh, you'll get a lot of it. But, but, the, but the, the vineyards will start leafing out by then. And, um, oh, cool. Yeah. Then you just start going higher up in elevation to follow the wildflowers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can do that, or you just come further north, you know, until you end up here. I think ours should probably bloom. So many it. places to go. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm just going to throw it out there. Uh, I want to have just a short discussion before I get into showing you some work that I, I have and some similarities and kind of my philosophy on photography, because uh, those of you that know me that have heard me talk about this before, I was first an artist and a painter, and I, I brought that sensitivity into my photography and do so more and more as time passes. And so my own idea with creativity in photography um, is that I think you should exercise your own artistic license. But um, one of the purposes that I, or reasons for doing this particular show that I've been wanting to do for a while now is is where do we begin? Like, how do I, like, we can learn techniques. We can learn Photoshop, and we can learn Lightroom, and we can learn how to use plugins. We can learn what a layer mask is. We can learn how to use our cameras. We can know what an f-stop is. But there needs to be a connection between all of that technology and our creative vision. Uh, Angie and, and Dave, you've both been involved in uh, the mentorships that I do. And one, the, the primary one that I run is enhancing your creativity. And it addresses one of those issues is creative vision comes from the act of doing with intention, of going out and shooting with intention and allowing your creative mind to begin to play in that you know, sandbox of the world out there, much like we did up north, Angie, uh, last week when we went up north into that freezing Ontario winter. <laughs> It was beautiful. <laughs> it is beautiful. And when you're dressed for it, really, I mean, did you get very cold? Not really. I came prepared. It really helped 
your list helped. <laughs> so, because <laughs> yeah. I don't do cold very well. <laughs> yeah. um, so I guess uh, I'm just going to throw it out there as and and I, I've seen your work all grow over the last couple of years on Google Plus. But what's your take on it as far as you know? Is there a too much? How far should you go? Um, you know, is there room for both the purist who says, no, I just want to take a picture and as close as I can get to what it comes out of the camera, that's better. Or to someone like me who's a bit of an artist and literally, like you'll see, I paint uh, with light on my images using a virtual darkroom. I, you know, I think there's, there's room for the whole spectrum. You know, I, I've seen arguments like this on, on various, uh, I don't know, various discussion forums. And, and to me, it's... It, it's kind of like the discussion of music. You know, people like their different their different styles. You know, and uh, some people who like you know HDR might be more the you know kind of like the someone who likes the impressionist music. You know, versus the you know, I mean, there, there's different styles of music. There's different styles of photography. Um, um, yeah. You know, some people like the photojournalistic look. I happen I happen to be more with Ron. I like the I like to play after afterward and the tools to to see what I can you know create because I because I can't paint I I you know give me a, a brush or a pencil and you know I can draw stick stick figures but um, but with you know with the tools you can you can play with that raw image that you that you took and make something really fun. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, my my I have a. a I'll, I'll pull out a little bit of a pet peeve. I have a pet peeve. Um, if you're if you're going to be a purist, or, or more a purist, you can't. Really, I mean, a camera modifies an image, but if you're going to be a purist, I would highly recommend shooting in JPEG, and setting up your camera to produce the saturation and contrast and and overall tone that you find most pleasing coming out of your camera. A raw image is intended to be edited. The point of a raw image, and uh, I'm probably preaching to the choir. Everybody watching probably understands this. But the point of a raw image is to contain as much information from your sensor as possible so that you can then take it into a post-processing program and infuse it with life. And so if you don't want to do that, there's nothing wrong with it. But please, shoot JPEG. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there are different settings on your camera, too, the different... You can you can do different things, like but landscape modes and pulling it into Lightroom. And and it makes it difficult. Uh, proprietary software interprets that really well. So Nikon software interprets Nikon really well. Canon software probably interprets Canons very well. Uh, Lightroom tries to do an interpretation of those settings that are in your camera and doesn't do a bad job, but still I feel that it needs editing after. It doesn't quite nail it. Um, what about you, uh, Elizabeth? What's your take on creativity? I know you love creativity, but what's your, I'll get you to say yourself. So. Yeah, I mean, well, I think people first of all need to do what they like and what they're comfortable with. And, you know, if people don't either have the desire or time to edit, that's fine. But I, I, I always laugh at the people that claim that people who use Lightroom, Photoshop, whatever, are not photographers. <laughs> yeah. I, I hear this a lot. The funniest place to me to hear it is in Yosemite. <laughs> oh, wow. I, was, I was there shooting um, or trying to shoot the uh, Horsetail Falls a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And there was a lady behind me saying, well, Ansel Adams would never use Photoshop. <laughs> and I had to turn around and just <laughs> oh, say, have you boy. ever seen his markups? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, he was a master of darkroom. He would have gone nuts. Like, yeah, yeah, and that, I think he would have totally embraced it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I just you know, I didn't I couldn't say anything. I would have <laughs> had a like three hour discussion with the woman, but Yeah. Um, well one thing I've learned is know when to pick your battles and that's a battle that nobody can win, I'll tell you, that's for sure. Yeah, and if you know, she doesn't want to do that, that you know, more power to her, but don't I think the main thing to remember about photography is there really are no rules. Yeah. That's, that's they are, but then you have to break them. <laughs> There's the rule of thirds. Of There's course. a rule of thirds and the rule of space. Well, maybe at some point it becomes photographic art and not 
Well, that's that's, that's kind of what I, I get on a bandwagon about is those rules are, are really shouldn't be taken as rules for all. What they are is a, a mm -hmm. big to begin to learn good compositional balance. What what is visual balance or visual unbalance? And I, I teach that in the in the programs, but um, you. I think you need to get to a point where you don't even think in, in terms of rules. You don't think in terms of thirds. You don't think with all those things in your mind. You begin that way. You learn these things either taking a, a, a program in art or a program in creativity or photography, but then it becomes your own. And all you think about is, is your picture conveying what you want in a balanced way, in a very pleasing way. And then it starts to become your own. It starts to become... Uh, identifiable. I mean, you can go through the stream and uh, Alan Shapiro's uh, birds will come up and you'll say, oh, I know that's Alan Shapiro. Well, why do you know that? Because he's learned Signature. to process in a way that he infuses himself into them. Mm -hmm. And you can see Mike Shaw's work with, with uh, portraits come up, or you can see Trey Ratcliffe's specific way he does his processing, and you say, that's Trey Ratcliffe. And even though people try to copy and sometimes get very close, it's not quite the same. Mm -hmm. They don't see the same, and that's the amazing thing about being on a trip with seven other or six other seven other photographers. Um, you can all stand beside the very same sunrise, and yeah. no two of the three thousand pictures you take that morning will be the same between mm -hmm. all the photographers, and that tells me that we mm -hmm. all, right from the very beginning, begin to infuse our vision into our photography. And so I did begin to identify certain patterns with the way I processed, and I didn't always do it intentionally. It kind of developed. But I'd like to share with you now kind of a process I take when I'm making decisions about processing. And I'm just going to share something very simple about, uh, number one, about the area of highest contrast in an image. It's, a, it's an intentional thought of mine now when I process, and it wasn't always that way. And the other one is color contrast, intentional color contrast. And both of them have to do with color contrast. And then I'm going to show you how I paint with light and color on an image. So let me do a screen share. Hopefully, um, um, you all stay with me and, and I don't lose you. I'm going to do my best to keep everything within our hour. And hopefully, it's really interesting for you and, and you'll, you'll gain a lot from it. Um, feel free to uh, bring questions from the room to me at any time. I don't mind being interrupted while I'm working. Um, I might pause and go quiet for a second while I gather my thoughts. <laughs> Let me do that screen share. And then in just a second, you're going to see, hopefully, my light room with a flower. Yes, we yep. see it. Uh, let me know when you do. What I'm going to do actually is move the, the Hangout over to my second screen because sometimes I drop a Hangout when I'm doing a screen share. If I, if I just move you guys over to the other monitor, I can see if I drop, the, drop it. So I can't see the chat right now, so you, I'll trust you guys to bring it in for me. And so um, what I just want to walk through, first of all, uh, make sure I'm in, I'm in the develop module here. is kind of, I'm just going to point out a few images, first of all, and what I'm talking about when I talk about, first of all, area of highest contrast and color contrast. And I'm going to show you a few before and afters. I'm going to lay it out on the table. You're going to see raw images as they came out of the camera. And then you're going to see processed images the way you've seen them in my stream. Um, and I think this is really important for learning. I think it's really important that we're able to see people that we follow where that image came from and what they did to arrive at their final destination. And let's not try and cover them as secrets, but share our experience. Um, and so that's what I'm going to do with you right now. Right now, I'm just going to click on before. Uh, for those of you who don't, don't know in Lightroom, while you're in the develop module, you can see before and after by hitting the backslash key. And so here's before. This is raw straight out of the camera. Um, and this is exactly as I, I composed it. And you can see it's it's uh, flat, it's fairly accurate color balance, but that wouldn't matter in a raw image anyway. I can change the, the, the color balance any way I want to. But it has a flatness to it. There's no doubt about it. There's no real depth to it. And, and that's perfect for a raw image. Um, 
I, I don't want to go too far into the histogram, but I just want to show you the very, if you look in the upper right here, the very right side of my histogram, it's not pushed all the way over. So these whites aren't blown out like they might be if I pulled that white slider over. Oh, look at what it did to me. It, it un before it. I can't do it. Anyway, I'll show you the after. If I was to move the white slider way over, it would blow out. It would leave the right side. That means I've lost information. So I'm not going to do that. And the, the, the side on the, um, I'll go before again, over here on the left shows me the blacks. And I, I'm not even leaving the page. Now, if there was something pure black here and this left the page, that would be fine. But there's nothing pure black here and it's not leaving the page. So that means I have 100% of the information of this exposure available to me to process with. And that's a great thing, even though the image out of the camera may be a bit flat. Now I'm just going to show you after and what I've done in post-processing. First of all, I've created a, a cross-process look by changing the tint of my highlight and shadows to oppose each other. But what you'll also see is right in this area right here is the area of highest contrast in the image. I've enhanced the contrast in that area and the sharpness along lines so that this comes forward. So when, just remember that the areas of highest contrast in your image, especially if they're light or white to dark, will come forward. You will look at them immediately, whereas areas of lower contrast and less detail will recede. Um, that's just a, I don't want to call it a rule. It's a guideline when you're composing, and it's generally true. And I'll show you more examples of that as we go. Here in this example is the raw image out of the camera. It's a 30 second exposure. And um, I light painted with a, my flash mm -hmm. the lighthouse. So it was dark out. There was light from the moon, really strong light from the moon illuminating the clouds. And some of the town of Torbomori was illuminating the bottoms of the clouds. But the lighthouse was in pretty much darkness. And so it's my flash that lit this image. And if we go to the next image, the after image is the enhanced image. So I did your regular thing. I did my cropping and I did some color correcting and um, I did some contrast control. And then talking about areas of highest contrast, if you look up in the area of the clouds, these clouds move towards you now. I'm going to go back. These clouds recede. Mm -hmm. These clouds move towards you. And it's not just the cropping difference. It's because I've created an area of higher contrast within an area of higher contrast. This light against this dark and this light area, even though it's darker, against this very dark causes the lighthouse to come forward. But the clouds come forward as well because it's a secondary area of high contrast where I have the sky and the cloud become, have more contrast. So moving along, this image here, and I'll, I'll just pull up the exposure just to show you exactly what I mean. Um, this is as shot out of the camera, and somebody might be disappointed with this. They say, oh, I like the composition. Um, this was actually done outdoors in direct sunlight. Um, mm. And you're probably asking me, how is that possible? What's behind me is my big reflector back black background of my reflector. I have a five in one. So it's just the no, background. That's of the yeah, I have that thing in my car, and I never thought to use it like that. Yeah. And then so the I, I carry two with me. And let me just double click the word exposure to get me back to the way it was shot. Above that, if you could see a picture, I could have loaded the one. I think I have a picture of me doing this picture, but I didn't load it. I have the scrim part. You know how you take the reflector off and you have that kind of translucent? Well, that's between me, the, the subject, and the sun now. I put that between the subject and the sun. So I've created a little light tent, and then I took the picture. Mm -hmm. And the goal of the picture wasn't a finished image out of the camera. The goal was so that I could do this next technique. And this is light painting in Lightroom. Much like I light painted the lighthouse back here, you're about to see how I light paint in Lightroom to give me that image. And so I literally um, use my adjustment brush, which you will see, to paint light tone, contrast, and saturation into specific areas of my image to create the final product. And so before and after are like that. 
I don't think outdoors I could get that lighting and mail it like that on on site. Yeah. It makes it look very three dimensional. Yes. So after. And so like if we talk about areas, yeah, that's right. It yeah. is. I'm adding three dimensions, and some of that comes from an understanding of form. I encourage any photographer to study some art, either in a mentorship program like Robin's or mine, where we uh, discuss artistic um, nuances of photography and, and, and bringing art into our photography, some ideas about form and color and, and composition. But because I've created highlights on a, an object that's not flat and more shadows and more highlights, I create three dimensions, even up in the leaf here. We, I've created more form. If I go back to forth, I've yeah. intentionally added more form and more drama to the image. Areas of highest contrast are the whitish against the blackish, so this definitely comes forward, as well as this color, this pink against the green. Uh, primary color theory goes red, yellow, blue. Now, I know photographers learn the RGB color theory as primary. But artistic primary color theory is red, yellow, and blue. And so the, the exact opposite color from green is red. And so pink is a shade of red, and uh, or a hue or a chroma of red. And this comes forward because it's the opposite color of green. So it really jumps forward. Let me move on. This one, straight out of camera again. Same setup without the black background. In fact, if you notice, it's the same flower. Um. Okay, and then what I do in Lightroom with a preset that I've created in, in cross-processing and then light painting with the different modes that you'll see me do. Uh, one of my signature images, this is right on my profile, mm -hmm. is the Druid picture, the ice forms on Lake Huron. Um, that was a really magical winter. That was a couple of years back. Um, and the, the lake didn't freeze. Um, right behind this is Lake Huron, and it's wide open water. And we had seen day after day after day of northeast winds spraying mist and water on these cedar trees. Until these are trees, the one in the background, I think, is about a little taller than me. It's about that size. It's not huge. It's about my size. But they are completely encrusted in ice. It's really cool. But what I was talking about, area of most contrast, if we look at it, is the, this main uh, kind of druid form. It's kind of really cool. You've got kind of a skull head. It was, and I didn't know Photoshop manipulation. That's how it was, the real thing. So I take from before, and I exercise my artistic license. First of all, it was a dramatic sunset. It did have a lot of color. And the snow had a lot of blue. Um, if you've been there with me, as you can attest, this these ice forms contain a lot of blue in their color, but it doesn't translate into a raw image. And so I did take it a bit over the top, but I wanted to communicate that feeling, and I wanted to accentuate the form. So not only do I have um, colors like opposites, like orange against blue, which are opposites, and red against the greens that are in the shadows, which are opposites, but I have my area of higher contrast in the area I want you to focus on. When you look at this image, the first thing you look at is that tall image. And then you begin to wander around the image. And so th there's an intentional process happening. And now I'm, I'm just going to warn, I know Lena's watching. Uh, I have a picture of my friend Lena Daywood, and she's on Google+. Plus. Circle her up. She's a very talented uh, student mm -hmm. at university, an incredible photographer. And this is her. And I think she's looking at a picture of me doing something silly in the back of somebody else's camera. And I took a picture of her. And the picture by itself isn't, you know, stellar out of the camera, straight out of the camera. I mean, she's stellar. She's very pretty. But straight out of the camera, it needs work. And so let's see what the after is. Now, what we have are a couple of things. Areas of most contrast are in the face, the eyes, the cheek area. Also, areas of most detail, the eyelashes around the teeth, the eyebrows. You notice how almost none of the hair is in sharp focus. It's very unimportant. But the face, especially the eye area, is very important. 
So here we have an areas of most contrast, like around the eyes and the face, areas of most detail around the eyes. And then we have this interesting thing happening in the background. I love that. <laughs> now, take a look at the original. Yep. Take a look at the after. And what this is, I'm just going to pull something up here. And, and uh, I'm going to walk you through the history of this one really quickly. So we'll go to import. And then I'm going to walk you up this left side of history. What I love about Camera Raw is I have this whole history to go back to. It's wonderful. Whereas in Photoshop, you have a certain amount of history you can go back on. And once you flatten an image, you lose the history. And Lightroom really nailed it with this. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's in Camera Raw in Photoshop. Maybe someone can, can jump in and, and, and tell me if it is. A, um, that's something I never even thought about because I do all of this in Lightroom as my camera raw. So uh, I don't think there is a history like this in camera raw in Photoshop. And so we go through some sharpening, some smoothing, some edge masking. Um, and then I use a preset, soft and natural. And I, like I say, I do use presets in some of my editing. I won't be doing that in my demo in a few minutes. but. Um, I, I, I taking a graduated filter, and this is the important one here. This graduated filter, so I do the soft and natural, and I do a bit of temperature tone correction, add a graduated filter, and I bring in this color. And what I'm doing is, again, color contrast. Opposite of blue-green is going to be orangey-red. Bluey-green, orangey-red. If you look at a color wheel, these will be exactly the opposite. If I took a color wheel out right now and I showed you, you'd see these colors, but it's not quite there yet. And in the end, I'll just go up to the top, um, we get to that. Because I want a bit of vignette. I really want to focus, and I really want to uh, create my image. And Ron, so do you create all your own presets that you're using? Not all my own. Um, the ones I've showed you here, they're my own. <laughs> Um, I really enjoy creating presets. I'm not doing that this particular show, but I think people should create a lot of their own presets once they learn a few basics about what they're doing, like creating split toning. Um, split toning is not a hard preset to create one or many of, and I really encourage people to do that. So let me just show you before and after. So before, I might not have considered that to be one of my better images out of the camera. And then I, I think and you can ask you can ask Lena in, in the chat on the verdict. I think this is a really great representation of her character. This is really her. Even though we don't get to see her eyes, this is really quite what she's like. So we'll go back to an image. The story behind this image, the finished image here, I'm just going to pop that down so you don't see too much of it, is this the finished image was my first massively shared image on Google+. And it, Early on, Colby Brown shared this image because it creeped him right out. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out what it is. <laughs> You'll see in a second. I'm going to show you in a second. So this picture is of a funnel spider or a tunnel spider. I'm pretty sure it's called a funnel spider. But the light was hitting it from the side on a path, and I saw it. And this spider stayed there and allowed me. Usually they're really shy, and they'll run back into the funnel, and you won't see them again. But I have a macro setup that allows me to shoot from the distance of three to six feet away. And so I was probably three feet away on this shot. So he wasn't so intimidated. The next shot shows the finished product. And so what I want to communicate with you is by, I couldn't get any closer to this spider safely without ruining my shot. So I didn't. I knew I could post, process, and crop later. And I thought about things like, you know, rule of thirds. And um, beyond that, I didn't really think much about it. This is one of the images that led me to realize I keep repeating a color theme. Can you see it in this image? Let me go back to this image. Can you see that, that image? The blue, theme. the blue, greens, and the, the, the orangey reds. And then it's kind of green theme going on. But those colors, if if I go through my, and I have, if I go through my portfolio, I love these colors. And I didn't realize they had become part of my signature. It was, it was almost as if 
it just evolved, which will happen. And you'll begin to recognize things later because part of who I am is drawing out of this image what really appeals to me. And so it's naturally going to start to become what I see. So in the fur and in the color, in the blues in here, um, we see that. And so I artistically accentuated this image to be what I envisioned it way back when I saw that little tiny spider on the side of the path. Um, this one, another very dramatic. Sometimes I do subtle, sometimes I do dramatic. Um, I had a goal. I drove, I drove 10 or 12 hours to go here to get a morning mist shot of this spot <laughs> on the Owasi Trail. Well, Ron, I've got a spot almost just like that, just right like walking distance from my house. We've got to go visit when you come. We have to. I, I'm trying to get there in early June, so maybe we can all go there, even Angie. Maybe early, late May. It looks a lot like Yosemite, too. Yeah. And so that didn't happen for me. So I stopped. I liked the light. I didn't have the mist. I didn't have the drama that I wanted. But I grabbed the shot. I grabbed three brackets. I created an HDR to get all my detail, even though I could probably do it from this one frame. Now, I, I realize um, I do far less with three frames than I ever did. Or I do far, yeah, I do more with one frame than I ever used to. I used to do it all in three frames, but it became this image. Hello. And this image was my vision. It's what I wanted to see. I wanted the morning mist. I wanted the light to come through. I wanted those rich after a rain greens and, and colors and uh, those signature reddish orange wow. color. Hmm. I would love to know how you created that. <laughs> I see this all the time when I'm walking in the woods, but I swear it, it has a hard time coming across. It doesn't across translate. The <laughs> it doesn't translate. And so part of the artist, part of the job of the artist is, is communicating what just wowed you, what just happened there to the viewer. Now some people may say, oh, that's not real. Well, no, no, it's not specifically real, but that's how I felt. You guarantee that's how I felt when I saw it the first time. And why I went back to that spot again at that time, you know. Um, and so this, this edit is not a short edit. It didn't last a couple hours, but let's think about the edit. Yeah. Think about areas of highest contrast. What do we have? We have one, two, three. The first thing you look at when you look at this image is right here and you come across the lines and then you go back up into the image. The lines all bring you back to this one area of highest contrast. Um, I will point out that although orange isn't the actual opposite of green, it's strong enough to the reds that it, it is a complement. It's not a pure complement, but it complements well. And even the streaks that happened up here, you get the red and the green complement happening. It creates a vibration. You get a red and green flare right here. And so uh, I'm creating color complement, contrast, and tonal contrast to create focus in the image. So what was a, a flat image that had no real point of focus, there was all kinds of competing contrasts. I was very intentional in creating areas of contrast, which finally brings me to this image, literally the one that, that was almost deleted. Now, uh, a group of us went to a little lake near where I live called Bond Lake in the fall to catch the fall colors, and we got there right for sunrise, and the sunrise was coming up, and these swans had been posing for images, but I was shooting with a 300 millimeter lens. Let's do an eye. Let's get some information on this. A 300 millimeter lens at a 40th of a second at, at f7.1. And I had my tripod, but they were swimming in a way, and I, I didn't have time to set, set it up. I was actually just popped it down, compressed, kneeled down on the ground, and, and un, like loosened off my ball head and used it as a, a loose monopod to get this image. And in a series of shots, they had moved from here to here in a few seconds, and then they were gone. I wanted this image so badly. I was there. The sun was streaming through. The, there was color in the sky. There was color on the trees. And I came up with this. And I pulled it out, you know, and I look at it and I go, wow. You know, and I, I passed it by. You know, it's one of the ones 
that has an X on it in the original cult. And I turned it into this image, which again has become one of my signature in images. But I, it was a challenge to myself. I just I was going through a creative thing, and I, I said, well, can I really do something with this raw image? And so this is not an HDR. This is not a three bracket. This is a one frame, one shot, a little bit soft. I mean, if you look at the focus on the original image, let's zoom in. Uh, I'll bring it right up to 300% to show you my raw file. It's not extremely sharp. But as a piece of art, that's as much as I need right there. That's, that's got everything I need in it. I look at the histogram, and I say, hey, I haven't lost any highlights. I haven't lost any shadows. All the information is in this image to make a final image like this. And so um, before I get into a few steps, I'm not going to live edit this. This is literally a two-hour edit. I'm not going to live edit everything. I will do some live editing to show you what I do, and then walk through these history steps and if you see me scroll through this you'll see why we're not oh, going God. through this in today's episode of the Photoshop show <laughs> that's a that's lot of rolling history today yes and I thought I added a lot <laughs> <laughs> but this is this is a two-hour uh, edit and um, I had an idea right away what I wanted out of this image first of all, Let's look at the things we talked about. Where is the area of highest contrast now in this image? It's right here. Yeah. The peaks against the background, right? You can't look at this image for the first time and not look right at those two swans. Mm -hmm. You can't not do it. We'll go back to the before. Although it's probably still the area of highest contrast next to the tops of the trees, which you'll notice I took away, in this image. Um, I accentuated it, and I'll show you that in this demonstration. And then I created some form around the mist. The mist existed, but not the form that, it, that I created around this shape, around the swans. And then look at the colors we have. The color over here, and the color over here. Let's go back to here. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yeah. Let's go back to here. Again. See that? And so when we talk about our creativity as artists, photographers, we begin to see patterns emerge that become part of our signature. And for me, it definitely comes down to a particular area of highest contrast along with a natural color contrast and often in a very subtle way. And these soft tones are, are the way I do that. And, and it repeats, and it repeats, and it repeats. But let me just go to this. I'm going to walk you through, um, hopefully in the next 15 minutes or so. Um, let me know if you get tired or you're sick of this. But I'm going to walk you through the process I took to get to this image, but not the amount of detail. So what I want to communicate with you is allow this to take some time. Don't think you'll get it right the first time. It's a slow process. And I'm going to click through these steps in the end to show you how it built in, in fast time. You know, But right now, I'm just going to walk you through this. So the first thing I'm going to do is say, hey, man, that's crooked. And just click on my crop tool and get that kind of that mist line in the background straightened up. And I already know in the beginning, and, and when I did this, I probably pulled it down to about there, and I wanted to get rid of some of this um, lily pads and pull up a little bit on the bottom. And I'll just hit enter for now. That's the beginning. Now, um, when I go through the basics panel, I really do go through it almost in order every time. And the first thing I'm going to look at is color temperature. This is as shot. It's a bit to the blue side. Um, hold on just one quick second. Sorry about that. So uh, I'm going to take my temperature 
And the first thing I want you to do is play with it. It doesn't have to be perfect. Like because a swan has white feathers doesn't mean they have to be neutral gray. They can be, you're an artist, you're creating. We're not photojournalists, we're artists. If you're a photojournalist, don't change the color of an animal. <laughs> don't, don't crop your pictures, don't add or take away things. If you're a photojournalist, if you're doing this artistically, let's play with this. Let's move it up. Look at what happens when we warm it up. Look at happens when we cool it off. This begins to get our brain engaged, our creative brain engaged. If we just moved around just a little teeny bit, trying to be perfect, our creative brain hasn't yet engaged. We're still analyzing. We're still using that science brain. We're trying to get an open door between right and left brain. And so this is what this does. Go all the way down. Take a look at it. Go all the way up. Take a look at it. And get some ideas. And then land somewhere where you think, you know what? I think I can work with it probably right about there. It's a bit on the warm side, but we'll deal with that in a minute. Contrast. I think I want to bring some of that up. So first of all, let's look at what contrast does. Contrast is stretching our histogram. It's stretching our highs and lows. It's trying to make our highs higher without overexposing, and it's trying to make our lows lower without underexposing. Watch what happens. See that? It's pulling it apart. I don't want too much contrast though. Maybe around there is going to be fine. And then usually when I do a contrast adjustment, I find I have to do a little bit of exposure adjustment. Just tweak it a little bit. Highlights, I don't know if I need any highlight adjustment. It's not changing enough for me. Well, I'll leave a little bit. Shadows. Let's see what it does. Mm. And this is the process. I'm, I'm not walking you through how to use Lightroom. I'm walking you through how I post-process and literally the steps I take. And I, I will go all the way down and all the way up. This is more or less on how I think when I'm post-processing, not as much how to use Lightroom. And so I don't think shadows are helping me or taking away. I'm going to pretty much leave them. To zero anything out, just double click on the name. The whites, I do think I can pull them up. See how I'm missing them right on the end of my histogram there? They're not quite white. They don't need to be, but I think this mist kind of needs to be brought up a bit. So let me pull it up. If I go too far, and whites will go quickly on me. It may be too much, but let me just play around. We'll move it down just so I can see. It's my dark room. So in the dark room, I might have exposed this 10 different times and processed it and took three hours. I get to play with it all within seconds here. I think I'm going to leave it right about there. And I want to draw the blacks down. See how dramatic that is right there? Yeah. Just that one thing. Now remember, this was a, as true as a raw image is ever going to get. Uh, it was flat. Um, there's, there's nothing more I can say about it. So, so we'll move the blacks down. Probably about there is good to start with. Uh, let me see my whites. Overall, pretty good with that. Now I'm going to pull my vibrance. Uh, I'll just go over this. We do this uh, a lot when I'm talking about uh, uh, Lightroom. But the difference between vibrance and, and saturation is that vibrance tries to protect skin tone. So if you have these warm colors here, or the fleshy colors that you see up in here and up in the sky, it's going to try and protect protect those while pushing more of the other colors. Oh. Whereas if you push saturation, it pushes everything at the same time. See how much hotter this all gets up here, up in this top area? I'll show you vi or Vibrance instead. Vibrance doesn't push it quite as yellow. It doesn't really nail it, but the, the blues and greenies come up a bit more. And so I'm going to move my Vibrance up maybe about half, maybe 50 even, just to get, because it's the fall and there were a lot of colors, even though you don't see them yet. So there's where we are so far with this image. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm thinking to myself, in my head, I know that I can hand paint some right on the swans themselves. And that's something that I do and I teach, is how to 
actually paint on, on your picture to create a little bit more detail or a little bit more contrast. But I wanted to create kind of an area here, like if we go to our after, you'll see that I had this intentional area of focus. Whoops. I'm zooming up to 300% now. Let's change that. It remembers the last one. And so I'm going to come here, and I'm going to start now working with my adjustment brush, which is my favorite tool in the whole wide world. I'm an artist. I have a brush. Here I go. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I'm going to zero out anything that I have here by double-clicking the word effect. I tend not to use any of these presettings. Uh, almost never. I just double-click, and I begin to work. I'm going to overdo it. And I'm Oh, he's back. Sorry <laughs> about that. I'm back. So let me know where I, I kind of froze up there. I, I wasn't quite sure when that it all of a sudden I got this notice to leave the hangout and I thought, what? He <laughs> threw you out. So um let me know where I was. I'll do the screen share. Oh, you were just as um you were just adjusting brush. Was ju yeah, just starting to use okay. the adjustment brush. Hopefully, every time you hadn't actually paint, you hadn't actually painted anything yet. Okay, so I, I I'm there now. You guys can see me. Yes. yes. We're cool. We're good. Yeah. Okay. It was such an amazing show while you were gone. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, <That's laughs> we <really> did. <laughs> oh, you guys. Okay, now we're back. Uh, as an artist, when I saw a, a brush. And I could control it with all of these controls here. I thought, oh, this is editing heaven. I can I can paint on my pictures. I mean, you can in Photoshop too, but this does so much of the work for you. It creates the mask. You don't see it. You don't worry about layers, or it it does it all for you. And so um, I'm just going to zero out. Oh no, not again. Oh, you're still there. Good. I'm going to zero out by double-clicking exposure here. You can zero out of everything by double-clicking effect. And by overexposing, I'm just going to paint in. Now, don't, don't be alarmed. Stay calm. Uh, I'm an expert. I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> That's what they all say. <laughs> stay calm. Stay calm. I'm going to paint in kind of that area that I wanted to start to see as an area of focus. And I'm going to draw the exposure down. You know what, I'm even going to increase my brush size, my brush softness by feathering. Oops. Yeah, I'm going to get rid of that history side so we see bigger. Let's get rid of all this. Uh, I'm going to increase my size and just get it to feather a bit more. 
And so it's kind of like that. I'm going to pull it down. And let me see. It may be contrast. What you got to do when working with this mist I've discovered is clarity and contrast are your friends. They can really help out a lot either way. Clarity helps bring it out, but it's often a little too much. You got to be really gentle with it. In contrast, you can soften or, or harden and make it com come back or go away. And this is really your mist control. Ah. Yeah, and then we can begin to use things like saturation, but see what it does? Those yellows are horrible. Oh, I wish this was vibrance and not saturation here. I can also shift the tint, which is more like what I'm likely to do because it's a sunny, warm morning. See the color on here, up in the tree up here? Mm -hmm. I'm going to add a little bit of light coming in on these. It's there, but the image is so flat you don't see it. You can see it a little bit back here on the, with the ripples in the water, but I'm going to grab that and go with it in a, in a sense. And so I'm happy with that for now. I'm going to click New, and I'm going to do a little bit more, just maybe right there, but bring that down again. Um, I think what I want to do is click new again. Every time I click new, it puts another dot. I'll just show you the dot. If you hover over it, it's going to show you where you painted. All of the dots are preserved. I can, I can do more to any dot at any time. I can go back to it and make any changes I want to that dot or delete it completely. So my edits are non-destructive. I, I can just carry on and go back. But in the end, you're going to find this has so many dots, it'll be hard to find which one controls what. But um, this is how it works. So I click New again. And I'm going to zero out of there. I'm going to actually turn the exposure up, turn my contrast up a bit. I'm going to bring in a little bit of light from the side. I'm going to turn it down some. And I think I'll bring in, now this is overdoing it a little bit, but I'm going to bring in some light from over there. And this is why I work with my, hello? Yeah. Good night. My daughter's going to bed. Uh, a little bit of light from the side, and I think maybe even a little bit here. Now, I can use my tablet, and it has pressure sensitivity, but I want to prove that it's not necessary. I can control my contrast of this area. See how it changes and makes it kind of transparent? Yeah and my exposure again. I can build up in as little bits and layers as I want. And so I'm going to click New. It goes back to my last adjustment. Oh, that's really cool. can do some more there. I can even highlight some of the edges of the trees and then bring it down. Very little. See how subtle that is? Yes. I'm not so happy with this over here, so by pressing Alt, I get the erase. And I can just go over some areas and erase. I'm not happy. I don't want too much up at the top here. I'm going to erase some of that. Turn it up a little bit more. Erase a little bit more. You'll notice my erase is a little slower. See my flow is turned down, down here. If I click, I'm just using the Alt key or, or the Option key on a Mac. And so I can erase at a little bit more slow rate. I don't have this much control with watercolors. It's incredible. I love it. Hmm. So I think I'm going to leave this for a second. I'm going to accept it. Hit close. I, if, if I have the toolbar up, I can choose, let's hit that. I can choose done, the word done. But by touching T, I eliminate that, give myself more real estate, and I can just hit close. I want to graduate. I want to create a little bit more dark from the top. So by using my graduated filter, I'm going to zero out here. Um, I'm going to bring my exposure down. And hitting the shift key at the same time as dragging keeps it parallel or horizontal. I can pull down like that. And I, I, I can decide what my transition zone is, and then by grabbing the middle bar and just 
pulling it all down, I can pull the whole shape down with me. See that? So I think I want it to be kind of like that. And now what do I do? Play with the exposure and get it just where I want, or the contrast to just where I want. I think right about there. This little on-off switch, you can check what you were doing right there. The changes take place slowly. The things don't happen really quickly. I want to create a new adjustment, and I want to come from the other side. I think I want to come from this side in. So if I hold the Shift key, I get to do that again. And I'm going to zero out. I'm just going to turn up my contrast a little bit. And now turn up some saturation. Start to get a little bit of color into this picture. And turn down my temperature. Look at that color. Oh, just made my heart sing. Do you see that color? <laughs> There's my color. Damn, I missed that. I'll do that again. <laughs> just so you see. I'm, you, you, I'll, I'll zero out here. I created this, um, the, uh, what's this called? Sorry? The graduating filter. Graduated filter, that's the one, yeah. I, see, I told you I go blank. Graduated filter. It's been through college. Yeah, it graduated. I increase the saturation a bit, and I bring my color to where I just get that sweet spot. Look at that. See that? My color. There's another way I can do that if the temperature is not working, if it's not quite right. I can use this little feature here that most people don't use, and I can find it in okay. here just by clicking around. See how I can do that? I can make it any color, you know? This is a wonderful tool, creative tool for creating a wash. So I could do that as well. I'll put that color in there. And I can change its effect just by moving up or down so it's less, more. And so artistic post-processing becomes, a, this is a painter's palette. And, and the brush is, is my brush. My graduated filters are my washes, my watercolor wash that I'm putting on here. Um, and that's how I walk through the process. And I ask myself questions as I go through. And I constantly will go back and I'll, I'll kind of go to before and after and before and after and see where I'm at. Because the changes happen so subtly, we often don't see what we're doing. So as one final step, because I, I, I know I, I want to be conscious of time for us. I, I know the, the uh, Hangouts always go a little bit over time. And, um, I want to be aware of that. What I want to show you is I want to uh, create my area of highest contrast. I don't know what I just did. I can't get my after now. There we go. I want to create... Um, a little bit more of that color for you quickly and show you how I create that area of high contrast. And this is something most people won't naturally think to do. It's not going to come to them naturally. In the final image, I, I just want to tell you there is a lot more detail in, involved in what I've done around these geese, around these ripples, around the mist, and around my saturation. But I just want to show you the process. That's what I've done. You've seen me go from, from, and you can see how many adjustments are, are there. Go from that with the crop all the way to that. So um, one thing I want to do is take my adjustment brush, zero out my effects, and add some of my other signature color which lives somewhere around here on this color zone. It's a fleshy color. And although I hate it in watercolors, it works great here for some reason. And so I'm going to overdo it first because I can go back to it, right? Every, I can always go back to it. And I'm just going to paint it right there. Maybe right there. Just put it right there. 
It's a watercolor wash. And then I'm going to come back to it and I'm going to play around with its intensity. I'm going to leave it there. Now to create my area of high contrast, I'm going to zoom in. But I'm going to zoom in to 300% here because uh, I'm going to do some detail. So here, 3 to 1. You'll notice, you can see the noise on my image, being that it's 400 ISO and I've been doing a lot of work on it. It was a 40th of a second. I'll deal with all that in the end. But for now, I'm going to zoom in on my geese. I'm going to make a smaller brush. So I'm going to zero, I'm going to say new, zero out my effect, bring down my exposure, make my brush smaller, and make my brush harder by moving my feather down. Now my edges aren't really crisp. This is important if you want to try this. You want to try and match the softness of the edge of your brush. I don't know if the the tool translates in a hangout if you're seeing the tool on yeah, the unfortunately we just have getting the rectangular block. Yeah, the rectangular. So if you do this in Lightroom, you'll see your round area with your softness at the edge. You want to try and match that with the softness of the edge of your image. I, I don't have a very sharp image. And so I don't want a super sharp edge to my brush, but not a super soft edge. So I'm going to make it small, very small. And I'm going to Having done my, uh, let me get rid of my histogram here now. It takes up my real estate. I'm going to move my exposure down, and, and I'm going to zero this color out. I don't want this color anymore. I just want exposure now. And I, I'm literally going to paint here. Now remember, I get to change this at any time I want, right? So don't be alarmed at how dark it is when you start. Um, I could go in and soften it right away, but I don't have to because I already know the result I'm going for. So if I fill this in enough, and I can move my flow up quite a bit if I want so that I don't take as long to fill in. Remember that I can always use my Alt or Option key, change my size, move my feather down of my, move my flow up. And then I can erase as well, right along the edge, just the same way that I started, right there. See that? Now I'm going to go to my other bird. Hello, bird. Uh, there's detail in an eye right here that we're going to try and bring out, but right now I'm just painting and I'm using my mouse. That shape. Make it a little larger now. I got my edges. Ron, do you ever worked on an image and finished it, thought you went too far and started over? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What I want to show you here, though, is that I get to adjust exactly how much contrast now I want there. So what I notice is the two beaks are going at a different level, like they're different. And so I'm going to get the darkest one the way I want it first. I'm going to click New. And I'm going to add a little bit more to the one that's still too light. Yeah, I do. I have just scrapped it halfway through an edit or maybe almost all the way through and said, let's do this again. I really failed. <laughs> it's OK to be unsuccessful. I don't want to call it failure. Um, it's OK to be less successful. I shouldn't have done that one over there. Let's get rid of that. We'll erase that. And we'll just bring this up just a bit so it matches. Uh, one more thing I'm going to do is I'm going to click New. And I'm going to accentuate the contrast, not the exposure, just on the eyeball part. Let me uh, touch that a bit. We can't see it because the, the, the spots are there. Um, I want to hide those spots. Where is my control? T. Control. I want to, right now, never show that because I want to work right on that eye. So I'm just going to click contrast there. Make it a little smaller. Click contrast there. And just play with that and play with the exposure. 
because there is an eye in there. And it doesn't, you probably think it doesn't make that much of a difference, but these little things you do to try and make it more realistic, they all make a difference in the end. So now I'm going to click New again. There's one other area I want to show you just quickly. What I did on the other one is I did paint. Let me just do this. I did paint a little bit of highlight down here and a little more shadow just to give the neck some form. So I just went down. Um, I'll do it quickly. I moved the, the exposure up a little. I added my secret color to that. And, oops, did a bad job there, control Z. Uh, I want to increase my feather and reduce my flow. So I just added a little kiss of that light to areas of the swan where there would be a natural highlight. And I'm moving really quickly, much quicker than I normally would, just for the demonstration. So if I go to one to one, and we look at them, and I, I, I do a before and after, that's where we're getting to. And the last thing I want to show you on this image is um, the shadows now don't make sense. The tails need a little bit more contrast to the water and to the white. And so again, we have our adjustment brush. We click New. We take our exposure down a bit. We move our flow up. We reduce our feather. We can move into 300%. And we just paint the shadow a little darker. I can move my brush a little bigger. Well, first I'll do small just to get the edges. And I'll make it a little bigger. Looks horrible right now, right? It's terrible. Be patient. That's the area, the sharpest area. The rest is a little softer, so I'm going to change my brush. I'm going to feather the brush a bit more. I'm going to turn my exposure down just a bit, right off. And I'm going to turn the color off because um, we don't want the color in it. Increase the size of my brush and finish off painting in here. When you do this on your own, take as much time as you need. Um, I, I am really just showing you the process, the really quick process of doing this. So with that brush selected, I'm going to start the other way. I'm going to go from back to forward. And then I'm just going to reduce my feather, reduce my size, and just finish off the detail there. And then we're going to go back out to one to one just to look at what we're doing. Whoops. Hey, okay, stop moving around. There. We can move them out here. And we'll just tweak that up a little bit. So from this is zero, we're just going to move it just a bit to there. Now let's go back to fit and hide this. Wow. And so I'm going to go for where we're at. This image isn't finished for me, but from before to after, I've created my area of highest contrast. I've made it believable. And these weren't difficult things to do. There was some areas that weren't detailed. I didn't have to, I didn't have to know how to draw or paint, really. I had to just accentuate some shadow areas. In, in those, or accentuate a highlight to make it just a little bit, a little bit more contrast, so my eye comes to it. Um, some of the other decisions I made were to eliminate the top altogether in the final go, to increase some of the color in my mist, and to get rid of some of the detail down here in the lily pads. So you can see that uh, the the differences I made getting to the final process. Now, um, I'll just take a really quick consensus if we still have uh, the attention of our viewers. Do you want to see me quickly run up this list and see what happened in this edit? It'll, it'll take about two minutes for me, or maybe less, to go through oh. this. Let's do it. Oh my God, eh? <laughs> let's, live, let, let's live on the edge. Shall we? Let's live on the edge. So first of all, 
we'll go to it's not going there for me there it goes the original image this is how it was this is my DNG raw file and we're going to start to move up and, and some things you won't see they're, they're my new things that I worked on or changed some things you'll see me go overboard and then pull back on some things will look like I've done nothing because I did a lot of detail work along the ripple and in the water and with retouching that just isn't that seeable. So let's just see my process, see how I think. We'll go up here. We'll watch it begin to change. So there is a vibrance, temperature. So here I actually did vibrance before temperature instead of like going down the list. But whatever contrast my white clip my saturation you saw me do all this in the first one the graduated filter I and, and that one was too far so I updated it with contrast and exposure I keep going then I begin to add brush strokes now these brush strokes here I, I, I don't I'm not sure quite what I did I was putting something somewhere it could have been the ripples that I was accentuating I didn't see it quite enough yeah there goes the details yeah, okay. Yeah, you see that? Yeah. I'm working on creating my area of highlights. So you can see this is a thought process. I know ahead of time this is intentional. It's when you go from experimenting to knowing what you're trying to get in the end. And that's a process that doesn't happen immediately, but you have to play in the sandbox. It's not going to happen if you don't play in the sandbox. And so here we're adding more brush strokes, uh, noise reduction, as I went, uh, sharpness, uh, more. I had some issues with uh, some funny more and some patterns. I don't know where they were, but it was there. I can see here spot removal. If you look, I, oh, trees true. up here had holes in them. I got rid of that. So there's a lot of detail stuff happening. Some more luminous smoothing, clarity. We keep going. These brush strokes are defining. Remember I said that shape I wanted? So in one instance, I defined it by using a highlight. In this instance, I defined it by using shadows and then making an exposure adjustment. Adding more just brush strokes to that same thing, to that same pin, and then I update. Uh -huh. Ability, more noise, more brush strokes. Uh, and you can see why this particular now I'm doing some temperature adjustments. Let's let it catch up to itself. I'll just try and show you. See where I brushed in that magic color? Mm -hmm. Then I pulled it back, and then I updated it some more. So do you see from here, look at the swans to here. You see the glow? Mm -hmm. And we keep moving up, and I keep getting closer to what my vision is. Some of it I know ahead of time. Some of it happens while I go. Some I know what I want. Like that shape. Like the contrast. And the fact that I'm going to end with those two colors. But the rest of it is is the playground. It's the sandbox. I keep moving. and I, One day I'll speed. You know how they do those speed films? Mm -hmm. What I'm doing here, in this add brush stroke, I'm adding form to the trees, but then you'll see me update the exposure adjustment. See how I've overdone it, then I pull it back. Then I add stuff to that pin, and then I do more brush strokes. And then I update it, pull it back, create the form. Wow. All the things you saw me do are just being repeated over and over and over here in little pieces and little bits. It's literally painting. It is painting. It's I call it light painting on my image in my virtual darkroom. Um, do you typically do a start to finish all in one session? or What's that, sorry? Do you typically do a start to finish edit all at I, once, or do I you have to, to step back? I used to. I don't anymore. I tend to stop before I'm finished and, and go back to it closer to when I'm done. I find that I... Uh, Oh, Marjorie McDonald has a question. I just saw it. Oh, Gary answered it. Develop module on the left. Click the little tiny arrow right there. There you go. And if you haven't edited the image yet, you won't have a history. Okay, there's my magic. So we'll see update tint adjustment. 
color temperature, tint adjustment. See it happening in that? See how I've, I've played with it and, until I get it where I want it. And now we do more with the brush strokes, the form. I'm skipping a couple, but you can see that this is a slow process, and I'm frequently checking my before-after with the backslash key to see how I'm progressing and where I want to finish with it. Um, this is an important one right here. Add brush stroke, update exposure adjustment. That was that streak right there, that light coming in. Add brush stroke, add brush stroke. See what I'm doing? I'm putting my light in the picture. I did that at an earlier phase in the demonstration to show you how I did it, but it's there. Then I make my minor exposure adjustments, try to tune it up just so. And then that got exported the first time to different published services. Um, let me just say about published services, um, I'm not going to get into it, but I can publish to many different things in different ways. And then when I make a change to this image, it updates the image online. So oh, wow. if you don't know about published services, uh, I really recommend you search it up. You watch it. We've done a few shows with it in it. So then later, I, I updated it. I, I did this. I updated the back black clipping. I updated the crop triangle. And I updated highlight views. All those changes are going to update now on the images I have online. And so if I go back and make later changes, I don't have to delete them offline or replace them. This does it for me. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And so um, that, that's it in a nutshell. I'm just going to run through quickly just uh, the, bottom, um, the bottom film strip to remind us of what we did um, in creating areas of high contrast here and areas of color contrast. Um, in this particular one, the areas of color contrast actually came in my split tone. I used yellow and violet in my split tone that created this look. Even though we don't have strong yellow, we do have the violet. But that was my opposite. And in here we have uh, the orangey glow with the blue, the red with the greens, both opposites. In here we have working, the reason we work with a raw file the, the drama of being able to paint with your light, with your brush, just exactly what I did on that image I just demonstrated, except in a different way here, with the same adjustments, the same things. Again here, excuse me. And now you guys all know my secrets. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to, to do exactly what I do now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And so um, you'll begin to see a, a certain degree of consistency with what I produce. Uh, and when we, we, we have the creative discussion like we did, yes, I think you will develop a signature of your own. No, I don't think you have to do it that way all the time forever. It's always changing. It's always evolving. Um, and we get to that last one, which isn't loading for me because I forgot to go back to there. Oh, there we go. And let me on screen share. Yay. Oh, that go. was just awesome. I'm so that's so my creative philosophy. <laughs> or one of them. Anyway, it's not everything, obviously. But when I, when I uh, make decisions when I'm processing, I, I just showed you literally what happens in my virtual darkroom and how I make choices. Some of it is an experiment. Some of it says move the sliders and see what's going to happen. Some of it is I have a preconceived notion about what I want to arrive at because of something I saw at the time when I was there. And I want to get there. I want to arrive at it. Um, I love to answer questions if there are any before I sign off. I um, don't see any at the moment. Oh. I, I think I bored everyone. <laughs> They're all sleeping now. delay in the comments on the hangout. Yeah, they're mesmerized. <laughs> sleeping, I think. Well, anyway. you know what's really funny is I've watched Trey Radcliffe um, um, go through some of his images, and it was so refreshing to me to, to have him sit there and go, okay, 
let's just see what this does. Let's just, mm -hmm. and he literally just went through the same thing, just experimenting. I'm, I'm sure he had a somewhat of a vision in mind, but he was just, and I was like, he does that too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not all written in stone, and he doesn't go in and go, okay, I know exactly that this slider is going to go to this number and this. No, he just played around and yeah. kept saying, well, that feels right to me, so let's move on to the next slider. And I was yeah. like, it's very it's refreshing to see that. Yeah. yeah, Karen Hutton does a very, very similar approach. I mean, I think all creatives do. Um, what you will find, though, is the more you do it, the more you will know exactly where to put these things. Like I know my sweet spots for certain colors and certain washes that I'm putting over my images. Yeah. Um, those things are things I've developed that I can go back to and do really quickly now. So what was a two-hour edit a year ago might be a 30-minute edit now because I just know. I, I know what uh, it comes from practice. Um, I don't want to mislead you and say that after watching this video, you'll have full comprehension of form and color and texture and shape um, and how to sculpt. That wouldn't be fair. Really? Um, yeah, it wouldn't be fair. <laughs> but I would encourage you to do a little bit of, of looking into that. I will promote my enhancing creativity uh, uh, here uh, in my mentorship. And if you want to know about that, just go to ronclifford.com under mentorships, where I help photographers that have little or a lot of technical skill but haven't really developed that artistic vision yet and I'd love to help you develop that so just go there that's a, a self promotion plug but that's how I get when you say mentorship oh thank you <laughs> yeah and she's in the last the final week eh? Yes, it's kicking my behind in a good way. Yes. <laughs> <It's kicking laughs> my behind. Well, the layers and mask class was really good too. Yeah, and you were yeah you've been involved in mentorships. I I just I love to do them. Um, layers and masks is fundamental. I love that mentorship in, in just grounding you in getting past the fear of Photoshop. <laughs> uh, Photoshop is a fantastic program, but it, there's so much. It's just so big. Where mm -hmm. do you start? And that's the layers, masks, and modes mentorship I run. So what I want to say about that is don't kick yourself too much for not being able to do it all. And I get a lot of people that say, well, you know, how do I get my images to look like that? Um, this is the beginning of that. This video that I just did is really one of the first times I've really let you in on a few little of those, more of those secrets. So, yeah, thank That's you great. for watching. Thank you for being part of it. Thank you for joining the, the, uh, the panel. It's been thank a pleasure. Thank you, Ron. And, uh, guys. Yeah, and uh, I guess we'll just sign off for now. If you guys want to hang out for a few minutes and chat after, that's great. But uh, I'll say goodbye to everyone watching, and thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>